Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Pantalone. I'm an endocrinologist at Cleveland Clinic, and it's an honor to be here today to talk about GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes. Our objectives today are to review the risks and benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. We're going to review the key differences between the various GLP-1 receptor agonist products that are available. We're going to incorporate new data with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy into clinical practice uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes with regards to the data regarding cardiovascular risk reduction with this class of drugs. And then we're going to develop an understanding of how this data has actually helped the type 2 diabetes guidelines evolve and why they have evolved. So first we're going to review the mechanism of action of GLP-1 endogenous GLP-1 is secreted from the L cells in the jejunum and ileum and this in turn stimulates a glucose dependent secretion of insulin, suppresses glucagon secretion, and therefore reduces the outflow of glucose from the liver. It slows gastric emptying, so patients feel fuller quicker, so portion sizes are smaller. It improves insulin sensitivity, as well as reduced food intake. So many patients will lose weight because of the uh, effects on gastric emptying and reductions in food intake, and that is why two GLP-1 receptor agonist therapies are also approved for the primary indication of weight loss. Now, the long-term effects in, in animals suggest that perhaps there may be uh, protection from a beta cell mass and beta cell function standpoint. Uh, we do have data that suggests that GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy restores beta cell function very quickly after the initiation of therapy, but actually whether or not it prevents the apoptosis or further decline in beta cell function in humans is clearly not yet uh, described. So these are the available GLP-1 receptor agonist on the market. Uh, you can see some of these products are once daily, some of these products are twice daily, and more recently we've had once weekly products become available. And so it's important to look at these devices to see the differences in how they work and how the medication is administered, because this may actually influence your decision making regarding which therapy you choose. So which one do you choose? I mean, this is somewhat complicated. Here in the United States, generally we have to choose what's available on the patient's insurance formulary and what's covered. Uh, so among those long acting agents, the patient preference and payer coverage are very important considerations. Now, if you look at the data regarding uh, efficacy, among the long acting GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are small differences in glucose control that favor the once daily liraglutide to the exenatide once weekly as well as albaglutide, which is no longer being marketed in the United States. The glycemic control appears to be very similar with that of liraglutide and once weekly dulaglutide, although higher doses that were recently approved with dulaglutide um, do appear to have greater A1C reductions. And hi these higher doses are the 3.0 and 4.5 milligram weekly doses that were recently approved by the United States FDA. Semaglutide 1.0 milligram appears to have the greatest effect on A1C lowering as well as weight loss among the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are available on the market. Uh, and there is a semaglutide 2.0 milligram dose for patients with type 2 diabetes that is currently under review by the FDA. And then an oral version of semaglutide, the first and only oral GLP-1 on the market, was approved in September of 2019 by the US FDA. So other considerations with the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist that need to be taken into consideration is cardiovascular risk reduction. Three of these medications are approved to reduce the risk of adverse cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. Those drugs would be liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide subcutaneous version. The oral version has yet to be approved to reduce cardiovascular risk. Now, an interesting distinction is that dulaglutide not only has the secondary prevention indication, but also through their study, the Rewind study, CVOT, uh, also noted primary prevention in patients who had risk factors for established cardiovascular disease, but did not have established cardiovascular disease. So that is an important distinction to consider depending on your patient's cardiovascular risk status. Tolerability of the medications are also important. Just because a patient doesn't tolerate one medicine doesn't mean they wouldn't tolerate another. So I generally will try at least two GLP-1 receptor agonists 
in my patients before I would move on to another class simply because of the tremendous benefit that these medications provide our patients with type 2 diabetes. The means of in injection is also important to consider. Again, some of these are auto injectors that are very easy uh, to use. They don't require, di require dialing of the dose. They don't require a pen needle be placed on. So if you have patients with dexterity issues, you know, using an auto injector like device would be more appropriate uh, to consider in those patients. And then lastly, you have to look at GFR. Exenatide based products are not recommended in patients with a GFR less than 30 and lixizenatide is not recommended in patients with a GFR less than 15. I think a very important point to highlight here is that GLP-1 receptor agonist therapies above that, loraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, are not contraindicated in patients with renal disease. This is an often mis, mis, uh, is a misconception that results in these patients being relegated to insulin therapy. But it is important to note that in patients with reduced renal function, even end-stage renal disease, you can use loraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide subcutaneous. Now, as I said, there's an oral version of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy available, oral semaglutide. It is once daily. Uh, you take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach when you wake up with a few sips of water, no more than four ounces, and then you wait at least 30 minutes to eat or to take other medications. It does require titration. You start with a three milligram dose, which is the first oral dose that gets you adjusted to the medicine. It is not an efficacy dose, and then you can further increase to the seven and 14 milligram doses, which are the efficacy doses, and you will see improvements in glycemia, and many patients will lose weight at those doses. Whereas the subcutaneous version of semaglutide, uh, it also requires titration, has that initial starting dose of 0.25 milligrams per week, which again is just the initial titration dose to get accustomed to the medicine, to help avoid the onset of side effects, and then you would go up to the 0.5, and subsequently, if needed, the one milligram dose to address uh, poor glycemic control. It's very easy, uh, easy to administer. It's a once weekly product. Uh, you can bypass the absorption issues above noted with oral semaglutide. Uh, and you know what, providers have really become comfortable with the existing subcutaneous version uh, of semaglutide. Uh, so you know that option may be better for many of your patients. You just take it on every Saturday and you forget about it the rest of the week. Uh, but you know a lot of this depends on whether or not the patients want to take an oral medication or whether or not they want to take a once weekly injectable. You can see with the oral semaglutide, you know, having to wait 30 minutes to take other medications or to eat can be a challenge with other medicines like levothyroxine. Uh, because of that, the American Thyroid Association has said that as long as you take it three hours after dinner, uh, you are okay. So you can take it the evening before the levothyroxine as long as you are at least three hours uh, post your last meal. And so that can help us avoid this issue where patients would have to take both their levothyroxine, wait 45 to 60 minutes, and then do the same uh, with the oral semaglutide. So it shouldn't be that disruptive to care to, uh, given these changes. So what are the benefits in general of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy? Well, Many patients will lose weight in addition to improving glycemic control. There is essentially a no risk of hypoglycemia with this therapy because remember, it stimulates glucose or stimulates the secretion of insulin in a glucose dependent manner. If your glucose isn't elevated, it's not gonna stimulate insulin secretion. That is distinctly different from that of a sulfonylurea that will continue to stimulate insulin secretion even in the setting of profound severe hypoglycemia, okay? So there is improved glycemic control, it's safer, it's in a glucose dependent manner, and that's why this class of drugs has essentially a low to really no risk of hypoglycemia. I reviewed with you some of these medications reduce cardiovascular risk from both a primary or, and or a secondary prevention component. There's also data that suggests there may be on the order of a two to three millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be used in patients with CKD, even end-stage renal disease. At least the three products can be that I mentioned earlier. And then again, I, I mentioned earlier about this potential uh, in vivo increase in beta cell growth replication or reduction in apoptosis in vivo with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. Now we will probably never be able to demonstrate this in vivo. We've definitely demonstrated it uh, in basic science and translational studies.
But I think one measure that will show us that potentially we are protecting the beta cell function and growth and survival of these beta cells is that type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. You go from one drug to two drug to three drugs to four drugs, not really because your insulin resistance is worsening. Rather, it's because of a progressive loss of beta cell function. Many studies will show that you have lost about 50 to 80 percent of insulin producing capacity at the time of diagnosis. So if you use 50% with time, that's gonna become 44%, 30%, 25%, etc. And that is why many patients will require insulin therapy later in the course of disease. However, I have noticed clinically, and there is good data comparing GLP-1 to basal insulin, that once you put patients on a GLP-1 and their A1C comes down, it kind of just stays there. Whereas with other therapies, you see that Nike swoosh sign where you see an improvement in glycemic control and then slowly over time, you see it deteriorate. So if you don't see that as pronounced with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, that means that there must be something going on to modify the underlying disease process. Otherwise, you would expect to see the progression of glycemic control deterioration as well as the need for additional therapy. So, you know, keep that into consideration when you're prescribing these drugs to patients and you see that not only their A1C gets better, but it kind of stays there versus other drugs that you may use. So to me, that is indirect evidence that there may be some protective effect on those beta cells. And then there's the question of whether or not there's kidney protection with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. This was um, picked up in cardiovascular outcome trials with this class of drugs, there was signal that there was a benefit on progression of CKD as well as progression of albuminuria. And these observation, observations prompted uh, a randomized controlled trial with subcutaneous semaglutide that is currently ongoing called the FLOW study. And they are following these patients as a primary renal outcome study versus placebo to definitively answer the question whether this class of drugs specifically subcutaneous semaglutide may also prov provide kidney protection. And then it's also important to recognize that these medications do have side effects as well as adverse reactions and warnings. Many patients who do have side effects, it tends to be the gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sometimes some abdominal discomfort, Rarely there's injection site reactions. These side effects, the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea are generally mild and do improve with continued treatment. So I generally would try to get my patients, if they can, to at least stick with it for a few weeks. If they're persistent, it's becoming a problem. Again, I would encourage you to stop that GOP-1 and to try another before moving on to another class of drugs because you will find it very surprising how patients can have significant side effects to GLP-1 receptor agonist A, and then you try B, and they really have great tolerability. I'm not really sure I understand why. There certainly is differences in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, but again, I would encourage you to try that second agent before moving on to a, uh, another class of anti-diabetes drug. There has been an increase in the number of reported cases with acute pancreatitis with incretin therapy versus other therapeutic classes or placebo uh, in clinical trials as well as in clinical practice there have been uh, more patients with acute pancreatitis reported with GLP-1 versus um, uh, active comparators. Now this is generally a contraindication but I think it is important that if somebody has a history of acute pancreatitis 10 years ago and they had cholelithiasis, they had gallstones, that was the cause of their pancreatitis. They had their gallbladder removed and they've had no problems for 10 years. That would not be, in my opinion, a contraindication to using GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. However, if a patient had acute pancreatitis from a GLP-1, you would not want to reuse it. Or if they had an acute pancreatitis episode a year and a half ago, the etiology is, is unclear, uh, the patient was very sick, and those patients also, you would want to avoid this class of drugs in patients with that history. And lastly, there is a boxed warning on all of these GLP-1 receptor agonists that talks about these thyroid C-cell tumors, including medullary thyroid carcinoma. Now, this was observed in rats and mice, and that's why this boxed warning is on uh, the therapies in this class of drugs.
Uh, but in humans, we have not observed an increase in prevalence of these abnormalities versus what we observe in the normal population who are not exposed to GLP-1. So while this is an observation observed in rats and mice, it's not something that we have observed to date in humans. Nonetheless, you have to recognize the warning. You need to recognize it. Talk with the patients about it so that they're aware. Because if they go to the pharmacy and they hear about it, or they go and see it on a commercial on TV and you didn't bring it up, they're going to think either you didn't know or you didn't care. And either way, that's not a good situation. So always acknowledge those warnings and bring it up with the patients. And what I tell the patients is, look, there are these warnings. I think the benefit outweighs the risk. And I'll tell them, if you were my mother or my sister or one of my other family members, I would feel very comfortable with you taking it. And that is usually very reassuring to the patients and help to get over any fear uh, that they may have regarding some of these adverse reactions and warnings. Now, how can we prescribe GLP-1 receptor agonist? Well, you can see that the most commonly used agents are on the left-hand side, column, liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, um, PO, and subcutaneous. It's important at the very top, liraglutide says Saxenda, but there's also the Victosa version, which is what we're gonna talk about here that was uh, an accident uh, in this slide. You can see the FDA approval order, the once daily dosing with liraglutide, the once weekly dosing with the dulaglutide and semaglutide subcutaneous, and then the once daily semaglutide PO version uh, is also once daily. You can see the dosing instructions there on the right about how to start the medication, how to titrate, uh, you know, as instructed on a timely basis. Uh, you know, so you can read through that, and I think that explains very nicely how you would initiate and titrate these drugs. So moving forward, I think it's very important to recognize that the available data we have does not clearly demonstrate that improved glycemic control improves macrovascular complications. So if we look here in the studies on the left-hand column, the first study is the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial. And you can see this study randomized patients to intensive control versus conventional. And in the intensive group, they achieved an A1C of 7.2%, whereas the conventional group had an A1C of 9.1%. It is very clear when that second column, microvascular disease, that the burden and risk of developing microvascular complications is reduced with intensive glycemic control. That is non-debatable. However, when you move laterally to cardiovascular disease and mortality, there was no observed benefit during the actual randomized controlled trial phases, evidenced by those green arrows moving left to right. But during the follow-up period, in the, during the observational non-randomized controlled trial phase, there was a signal that perhaps down the road, there may be a cardiovascular benefit uh, from cardiovascular disease development and major adverse cardiovascular events and mortality uh, with intensive control. But again, that was hypothesis generating. It was observed outside the initial randomized controlled trial phase. If you look at the next study, the UK PDS, this was the landmark study in type 2 diabetes patients that compared intensive control versus conventional. Intentional group had an A1C that was less than 7. The conventional group was 7.9. Again, you can see microvascular risk reduction was clearly apparent, the downward blue arrows sh uh, showing that intensive glycemic control reduced the risk of microvascular complications. Again, not debatable. But we observed the same thing that we did with the above trial, where during the observational phase uh, of the trial, we observed some signal of a benefit with the downward arrows of purple versus during the randomized control trial phase, we see the lateral arrows that move left to right. And then at the bottom, the more recent trials that were completed in the 2000s, we had the ACCORD trial, the ADVANCE, and VADT. And if you look in the first column of microvascular complications, even in older patients with established cardiovascular disease or risk factors for cardiovascular disease, we saw microvascular risk reduction. So again, it is not debatable that intensive glycemic control reduces microvascular risk. And in the advance in VADT, likewise, we did not see any signal that there was cardiovascular disease or mortality benefits with intensive glycemic control. Actually, in Accord, you'll see the red arrow pointing upwards, there was an observed increase in mortality in the group that was intensively controlled, and for that reason, the study was stopped. Now, many people have debated whether that was related to hypoglycemia, 
Uh, A lot of the evidence suggests that the highest risk of mortality was in those patients who had the highest A1Cs that didn't improve, okay? So I'm not necessarily sure that it was the intensive control per se that drove this increased mortality risk, Uh, but nonetheless, it was observed, and it is for that reason that the ADA modified their guidelines and said we need to have individualized A1C targets in patients rather than treating everybody to an aggressive targets less than 7 or less than 6.5 because of the potential for adverse effects with intensive control in this population. So there's no clear evidence, again, that intensive glycemic control reduces cardiovascular risk. But in the 2000s, in response to a meta-analysis that was done with rosiglitazone that suggested there may be an increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death in patients treated with rosiglitazone, the FDA mandated that safety trials be conducted with every type 2 diabetes medication moving forward to demonstrate cardiovascular safety. Now that meta-analysis that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007 with rosiglitazone and adverse risk was later discounted by another group that reevaluated the data. But nonetheless, that report is what prompted all of these studies to be conducted, greater than 190,000 patients. So had it not been for that meta-analysis, we would never have conducted all of these studies that are highlighted here, and therefore we would never have observed that this that many of these drugs, specifically GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors, provide benefits beyond their improvement on glycemic control. GLP-1 receptor agonists were shown to improve cardiovascular risk by reducing cardiovascular risk, and SGLT2 inhibitors have also been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk, as well as protecting CKD decline, development of end-stage renal disease, and reducing the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization of heart failure with SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with heart failure. Now, there are differences in the labels between the individual drugs within class regarding what they actually demonstrated uh, and what their absolute indications are. But in general, just trying to summarize, those were the benefits that were observed. So now that we have type 2 diabetes drugs that have shown to be able to reduce the risk um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, we have to prioritize using these medications in patients with established cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes or patients who are at high risk of cardiovascular disease and have type 2 diabetes. It is very important to recognize that 7 out of 10 patients with type 2 diabetes will die of cardiovascular causes. And it is also important to recognize that our primary care provider colleagues manage 90% of patients with type 2 diabetes. So we really need them to feel comfortable prescribing these newer agents that can not only help to improve the glycemic control and reduce their patient's risk of microvascular complications, but also to leverage these therapies, such as GLP-1 receptor agonists, that can provide the additional benefits of reducing cardiovascular risk in these patients. Now, I have all this information up here not to go through it all. These are the characteristics of GLP-1 receptor agonist CVOTs. The reason I have this up here is so that you can appreciate that the patient populations in these studies, in each column, are different from left to right. right? So you cannot compare these studies as apples to apples. Rather, they're apples to oranges. They had different populations. They had different baseline A1Cs. Uh, They had different percentages of females versus males. They had different percentages of patients who had established cardiovascular disease versus high-risk cardiovascular disease. So that is why these trials all showed very similar but different findings. Some of them showed benefit on three-point MACE. Uh, Others did not. Uh, And a lot of it had to do with um, how these medications uh, were prescribed in these studies and the different populations that made them up. So in general, I'm going to try to pull together a global look at this class of drugs and their effect on cardiovascular risk. But note that each of these individual trials did show something different uh, with regarding cardiovascular risk. This is a very well done meta-analysis. At the very top, we put all of these studies together and looked at major adverse cardiovascular events. This is a forest plot with the vertical line being one. So if the hazard ratio and confidence interval are below that to the left side of one, that suggests benefit. 
Now, some of them are completely below one. Others, the hazard ratio and or confidence interval is crossing one. But overall, when you put these into a meta-analysis blender, we observed at the bottom a 13% um, a 13% relative risk reduction with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy with regards to major adverse cardiovascular events, which is non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and cardiovascular death. Now, if you separate these into those patients who had established cardiovascular disease or those patients who did not have established cardiovascular disease, you will see in that middle section that the majority of the benefit was observed in patients who had established cardiovascular disease versus those who did not have established cardiovascular disease. So the strong data here is with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, reducing the risk of adverse cardiovascular events in people who have established cardiovascular disease. So what is the proposed mechanism? Well, it's important to recognize that GLP-1 receptors are located throughout the body, just not on beta cells. And so there are GLP-1 receptors located in the vasculature, specifically endothelial cells. And GLP-1 agonism of those receptors has demonstrated reduction in inflammation, improvement in endothelial function, improvements in vasodilatation, improved plaque stability, improved blood flow, decreased smooth muscle proliferation, as well as a reduction in platelet aggregation. So all of these effects together are mitigating the atherosclerotic disease process. So if you have patients with established cardiovascular disease and you're on one of these therapies, the thought is that the therapy is mitigating uh, or reducing the progression of that underlying disease and therefore reducing the risk of future cardiovascular events. So how have these drugs and findings of reducing cardiovascular risk change the guidelines? Well, this is the guideline from 2018, and if you look at the very top, it, it um, tells you that you need to prioritize metformin and lifestyle modifications for first-line therapy, but then underneath, at the bottom of that red box, it says, if hemoglobin A1C is above target, proceed below. Then it wanted you to look at whether or not the patients had comorbidities or risk factors to initiate those classes of drugs, GLP-1 receptor agonists, or SGLT2 inhibitors in those patients. But when you think about it, this didn't make sense. Whether or not your A1C is under goal or at goal shouldn't determine whether or not you receive drugs that may reduce your risk of adverse cardiovascular events or progression of CKD um, or heart failure in patients with those comorbidities, whether their A1C was at target or not. So if your A1C 7.4, the guideline was suggesting if they had cardiovascular disease to add one of these drugs, but if your A1C was 6.8 to not add one of these drugs, which made no sense. You know, that would be like giving a statin only to patients with elevated cholesterol who have type 2 diabetes. Whereas we know that everybody who has type 2 diabetes, whether their LDL is above goal or not, should be on at least a moderate intensity statin. So I kind of look at this as a very good analogy, okay? So if you then go to the next iteration of the guidelines, we're looking at 2021 here. It said first line therapy again is with metformin at the very top, as well as lifestyle modification. And then it immediately said, if the patient has indicators of high risk of these conditions, you then independent of the A1C target, intensify therapy with one of these drugs that can improve outcomes independent of their effect on glycemic control. So you can see here, I have the blue and red highlighted opposite from what I did the previous slide to show you how these two things were reversed in the algorithm. They are now prioritizing the history of these comorbidities and cardiovascular, renal, or heart failure risk above um, whether or not the A1C is at goal. And then more recently, the 2022 guidelines have taken a step further and they have kind of moved away from clearly stating that metformin should be the agent of choice along with the lifestyle modification to treat type 2 diabetes patients. Here, it's suggesting that if you have underlying comorbidities, patient-centered treatment factors, 
including cost and access considerations, and managed needs, and generally includes metformin. So if you have these comorbidities, first-line therapy may not necessarily um, be metformin. So keep an eye on this, that in patients with these comorbidities at risk of progressing, that it is appropriate and the guidelines do endorse, although in somewhat of a wishy-washy, politically worded way, that these therapies can be initiated and in certain cases should be initiated ahead of or with metformin. So as I mentioned earlier, what about GLP-1 receptor agonist and renal risk reduction? There was suggestion of the data from secondary analysis of the cardiovascular outcome trials that there was a reduction in the risk of progressing of renal disease, um, th that being GFR as well as um, the increased risk of progressing of the albumin to creatinine ratio in these patients. But we were lacking a appropriately powered renal outcome study with GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. So therefore, a study was initiated to see if subcutaneous semaglicide once weekly compared to placebo in people with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease can reduce the risk of renal outcomes in these patients. So it's called the FLOW study. It's on clinicaltrials.gov. It's currently uh, in process. And the primary outcome is time to first occurrence of a composite primary outcome to first event defined as persistent EGFR decline of greater than or equal to 50% from trial start, reaching end-stage renal disease, death from kidney disease, or death from cardiovascular disease. So this is gonna be a very interesting study uh, to see move forward. The results uh, could also impact the algorithms because now there would be data that GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy can not only reduce cardiovascular risk, but perhaps also renal risk therefore putting it more on par with SGLT2 inhibitors in patients who have uh, both established cardiovascular disease and underlying CKD. And I want to make one more important point that if you have CKD, your risk of dying from a cardiovascular event is much higher than the patient with CKD actually progressing to end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis. So CKD with proteinuria you know, CKD stage three or lower is really a cardiovascular risk equivalent. We know that those patients have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and actually have a higher likelihood of dying from a cardiovascular event rather than progressing to end stage renal disease. So keep that in mind in your patients. Lastly, it's important to highlight that everything I talked about today is great, but you have to manage cardiovascular risk in type two diabetes patients on a global scale. Everything I talked about would be totally irrelevant in a patient who's smoking versus non-smoking. Clearly the biggest benefit that we can make to reduce cardiovascular risk in these patients who smoke would be quitting smoking. Would adding GLP-1 provide benefit? Probably. Would it provide the benefit that we would like to see uh, in patients if they weren't smoking? Probably not. So um, in patients who are smoking, we would probably expect to see a greater benefit versus those who are currently smoking. It's also important to have that blood pressure uh, at target, which is also somewhat controversial, whether you're aiming for less than 140 over 90 or less than 130 over 80. The guidelines, whether it be a hypertensive guidelines, diabetes guidelines, or nephrology guidelines for CKD, really kind of bounce between those areas, and there's really not a 100% definitive answer. But you need to have the patients on the ACE or ARB therapy because we know that that reduces the risk of progressing of CKD. Hyperlipidemia, as I mentioned, type 2 diabetes patients, irrespective of their LDL value, should be on a moderate intensity statin. If patients have type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, they should be on a high intensity statin, irrespective of what their LDL value is. Uh, ezetimibe has been shown uh, when added onto simvastatin to have uh, an additional benefit on cardiovascular risk reduction. So if you do have residual LDL elevation in a patient who you do believe is still high risk with that LDL value, you can add the ezetimibe. There's also cardiovascular benefit data with PCSK9 inhibitors, but you know these are more expensive, they're injectable, so depending on the patient's circumstances, they may or may not have good access to that class of drugs. But that is very potent at reducing LDL cholesterol in patients who have residual LDL um, elevations, as well as people that have these familial disorders uh, that are 
predisposing them to having extremely high levels of cholesterol. And then there is the triglyceride lowering therapy, icosapent ethyl, which was recently shown to reduce cardiovascular risk uh, in patients who had elevated triglycerides, uh, as well as on statin therapy. And you know, it's not really clear the mechanism, uh, whether or not it was truly related to triglyceride lowering. The thought is that it was not. Uh, rather, it's thought that it had a plate, uh, an effect on antiplatelet activity, uh, as well as some other cardiovascular mechanisms. Congestive heart failure, we've progressed a lot. We have a lot of new therapies available. Uh, you have the Arni drugs, uh, the uh, Sucupitril, Valsartan combination. We have the aldosterone antagonist. The older one, spironolactone and apleridone, did provide benefit in the RAILS trial and the Ephesus trial, respectively. However, when you try to use those medicines in people who have CKD, you get difficulty with the potassium, okay? So a new medication, a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist was recently approved, and that's called finerenone, and that has been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk as well as the progression of CKD uh, in patients with CKD. So I think we'll be seeing a little bit more of that moving forward. And then I already reviewed the data with SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, you know, they can not only provide benefits with reducing A1C and perhaps assisting with weight loss, but also they can reduce cardiovascular risk, reduce the risk of progression of CKD, as well as provide a cardiovascular death benefit, as well as hospitalization for heart failure reduction in patients with congestive heart failure. It's also important to make sure that patients are on the appropriate antiplatelet anticoagulation therapy uh, stratified by their underlying risk. And then again, highlighting type 2 diabetes, whether or not they have all the other things above. If somebody has established cardiovascular disease, you know, you need to prioritize these therapies that can reduce cardiovascular risk while also providing that benefit on improved glycemic control if needed. But even if their A1C is at target, if they have established cardiovascular disease or they're very high risk cardiovascular disease, you should be initiating these therapies if possible, irrespective of whether their A1C is at target. And let's not forget about the obesity, which drives the development of many of these comorbidities and addressing that primary problem early in a patient's life cycle will help to prevent many of these complications from developing down the road. Uh, and to keep our patients healthier and perhaps help reduce their burden of management. So thank you very much for your attention. It was an honor to present this information today. I hope you found it valuable, and I'm sure it's going to be able to help you manage your patients and keep them healthy for the long term.